everybody. Welcome back for another episode of Introducing. Today is a really special episode because we're going to talk about the beautiful viola da gamba. But of course, I don't play that instrument. <laughs> so I have brought my friend and colleague, Craig Trumpeter, who is a wonderful uh, viola da gamba player and the director of Haymarket Opera Company here in Chicago. Hey, Craig. Hey, thanks for having <laughs> us. Me. Of course. <laughs> us, me. Well, I'm happy to be here too with you. So. Me and this. Me and this. So what's the difference actually between a, a cello, if you're a modern cello player and you saw a gamba, what strikes you as being different? Well, the look of it is certainly different. Um, you know, it has the C holes. Um, Rather than the F hole. <laughs> instead of the F holes on the cello and the violin. The, bl the back is usually flat and mm. there's this little sort of sloping area here. Yeah. It looks a lot like the contrabass in a, in a modern orchestra, actually. Mm. Um, it's got many more strings. Uh, it has frets, which is... Um, I'm familiar with those. Yes, you are, <laughs> yes. Uh, they're double frets, actually, on, on, a, on a vial. Um, so and the frets are great because, uh, you know, cello music, you do play a fair amount of double stops, mm. double notes in, and chords from time to time in cello mm -hmm. music. But on the viol, just like on the lute, you can play chords pretty readily. I wouldn't say they're easy. But is it because the is the bridge more rounded than a cello? The bridge is more so. Uh, no, uh, it's it's more that we we play more chords on the viol because of the frets, hmm. because we can do these kind of unusual hand positions. Yeah, right. That you would never do on a cello. Really. Is it because you couldn't get it in tune? Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's it's still a, a challenge to play them in tune, but it's a lot okay. easier than if without frets. <laughs> uh, they a lot of, you know. Some of the really virtuosic composers like Forfaré and Marais mm -hmm. write chords way up here in the Petite Manche above the fingerboards, wow. above, above the frets, which is um, annoying. <laughs> As a cello player, can you pick a viola de gamba up and just uh, instantly start playing it, or is it like, what is going on? No, you know? <laughs> it's, it's pretty confusing at first. Uh, for one thing, it's, it's, if you're a modern cellist, you grow up using a, you learn to play using a, a, an, an end pin in the... Hmm in the bottom just to keep the instrument there. So you're not oh, yeah, actually right. busy holding it. With a vial, you have to, it takes a long time to, <laughs> to figure out how to hold it yeah. without, without one. So that's why this is called the viola de gamba then, right? Right, the gamba part refers to your legs. Gamba means leg in Italian. Uh, braccio is arm. Mm. So the, the arm vials, viola da braccio, uh, mm -hmm. are the violin family. Uh, with the cello, obviously, had to be held this way. Uh, but even the smallest size of gamba, viola da gamba, is held on your legs. Hmm. Uh, but this tuning is in fourths. With a third in the middle, and then more fourths. And so this instrument has a low A. So just like a lute. Mm -hmm. So this instrument is D, A. Oh, it's D on top. Yeah, D, D, A, E, C, G. D, and then it has a, this instrument has a low A. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, but it's very lute-like, the tuning. We yeah. usually, yeah, lutes usually are tuned in fourths with a third uh, in the middle. And guitars, uh, modern day guitars still have a very similar tuning, mostly fourths and one third. Which the is... six strings and the, out of the six to, from low to high, we have all fourths except the third to the second is a major third. Right. Okay. Uh, so yeah. that's interesting because aren't, because cellos are tuned in fifths. Right, and it's, so it's, there is this place in the instrument when you, if you're a cellist, uh, in the middle of the instrument, you, once you've learned how to deal with strings that are a fourth apart, uh -huh. you have this weird place in the instrument where you have to remember that you have a third. Yeah. But after a while, you get used to it, and it's, um, it's actually really wonderful. So. Wow. What about the the headstock? Sometimes I see as well. There's like a, there's like a carve. There's always some sort of carving. Like you have a beautiful spiral. Yeah, this one is just a particular style. You can kind of they carved out the um, the center of it. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes you'll see a little lady sitting up yeah. there or a lion or something. Yeah. It just depended on the maker and and uh, they kind of did it di differently depending on which country they were making them in. I'm always jealous. I want one on my door bar or something. <laughs> just put, put a little decal up there. Yeah, right. I'll start putting stickers on it or something. <laughs> so the other big uh, difference between the violin family and the viola da gamba family mm -hmm. is the way you hold the bow. So mm -hmm. 
on the violin or, and the cello and the viola, you put your hand on top of the stick and you apply weight to the stick, which then pushes the hair into the strings. Okay. So you can play pretty strong, you know, concerti, <laughs> yeah. um, dance music and that kind of thing. But on a, on a viol, you actually are de dealing directly with the hair itself. So you put your fingers, kind of thread them through, mm -hmm. and then you, it's a much lighter approach, and it, but it's a little bit more like speaking. You have a, quite a lot of, well, if that didn't work. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> you can really play with these really fine articulations. Is it so because you, you're controlling the hair as well as the stick itself? You're not. It's it's funny. I don't think about to think about the stick much at all. The stick is like there to keep the, the bow hair tight. Right. Um, and I'm just actually just dealing with the hair itself. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so another thing that's a little bit different for a cellist coming to this instrument is to um, learn how to not try to overplay it. It just doesn't mm. make as much sound. Right. So you have to get comfortable with you know the aspect of, of that you talked about it with being a lute player that you know there's just not a lot coming out the mm. harder you try the worse it sounds actually. Yeah. So, so you can't when you're coming off your Saint-Saëns and your Dvorak concerti it feels quite different <laughs> I think the the viol and the lute probably went the same way met the same demise in the, <laughs> in the 17th or the 18th century excuse me um, with the advent of the orchestra and the larger opera house and the string quartet you know the the cello sort of took over and mm. the viol was just it became the instrument for like sort of connoisseurs and uh, mm. but it's really it's uh, the perfect instrument to play polyphony so right. up until um you know the the 18th century you were playing this wonderful repertoire that works so beautifully on an instrument like this because the sound is is very clear but it's not opaque you can hear through it and you can hear multiple lines at the same time so, so actually you know now that i'm thinking about it I'm realizing that I don't even know when the, the gamba came into existence. Around 1600, maybe? No, no. It's really, um, I always think, basically, it's, it's the same time as Columbus uh, arriving in the Americas. OK. Um, and uh, the, the vial had sort of been developing, probably. No one knows for sure, but in Spain uh, hmm. before that. And then it was Ferdinand and Isabella kicked out all the Jews from Spain. And a lot of them went to Italy and hmm. brought these uh, these sort of instruments that were maybe in between a, a plucked uh, vihuela de, de mano right. and a viola de arco. They were kind of, it was like a bowed guitar, bow, bowed lute. Mm. Uh, and they brought them to Italy. And then from there, they just developed into something that was a little bit different. In the, in the um, Renaissance period, the viol would have been used to play textless madrigals. So you could just mm. take a madrigal and just play it instead of singing it. Oh, yeah. uh, you could do the same with masses and motets. Um, so there's this you know, kind of endless repertoire that you can do there. Mm. Uh, and some of that in the, in the 17th century in England particularly, uh, there was this sort of resurgence of activity with the viol. And mm. a lot of really wonderful um, fantasias were written by all the greats, Bird and, and um, Laws. And, mm. So, Purcell. Uh, so there's a really wonderful, rich repertoire there. Mm. And then we kind of get into more the soloistic uh, uh, rep of the 18th century. Mm. Uh, and you know, you're more likely, you'll most likely hear this instrument if you go hear one of the Bach Passions, oh, because right. there's a, a beautiful gamba solo in each one. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, I think we had this conversation once, but am I, am I mistaken to say that most gamba players Nowadays, at least, discover the gamba through uh, that wonderful French movie, Tous les matins du monde. Tous les matins du monde, oui. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, in fact, I did, really. Yeah. I, I had already been playing for a few years when, it, when the movie came out, but I didn't really know what, mm. I had never really heard a viol except my own, under my own fingers. Right. <laughs> and I, I do think that a lot of viol players, myself included, were inspired by it. Mm. Earlier, we were talking about the um, different sizes of the vial. This is a treble vial, treble gamba. You would also hold it on your lap like this vertically. Uh, so, I mean, so while cute. it could fit under your neck, it's, <laughs> it's uh, better played this way. And then there are several other sizes. There's a, a, an alto vial, which is a little larger than this. Then there are two sizes of tenors. There's the bass, and then there's a big violone, uh, hmm. which you would play almost standing up or at least sitting on a high stool. 
Yeah, I've seen and then there's also two other, um, at least two other instruments we think that were um, used for very specific repertoires. There was the lira vial in England, which uh, uh, would Tobias Hume would have played for mm. tobacco, uh, for that oh, yeah. song. Um, we actually got a little take of Craig singing and playing the Tobias Hume tobacco. We should hear it now. So I've strung my treble viol in all gut. There are, nice. there are no wound strings on it. Cool. Uh, and it works fine just because it's, it's, you know, the lowest note is a D, the D below middle C. Right, so it's not that big of a string. But yeah. once you get to this right. guy. The, the, the bass instruments really needed to have overspun strings. Uh, so, and by that you mean like with metal? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, once, you know, to play certain repertoires, you can, you can play earlier rep up until maybe the mid 17th century on, hmm. on um, all gut strung. Oh. So here's, here's a little sample of the treble vial. That's gorgeous. It's so, uh, it's so vocal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, really that piece, that little bit of uh, snippet of Purcell that I just played is one of the last pieces written for the viola da gamba consort. Wow. Uh, yeah, so, and that was in the, you know, the 1680s. Hmm. Well, I'd be interested in trying to pluck one of these things and oh, seeing yeah. how my lute technique works. Maybe, sure. the, maybe the little one? Sure, let's do it. I'm afraid of the big one. I'll, put, I'll <laughs> hook you up. Whoa. I'm just gonna use loop shapes here. It works. <laughs> nice. Nice. Kind of. <laughs> see if I can try a, a folia. Whoa. There it is. It's so much fun to play. Well, I think I won't be sounding good on this anytime soon, but, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for letting me try. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, this is so cool. I, I, f I feel like you've answered so many questions that I've always wanted to know <laughs> about the gamba, and now I just feel like I have to go deeper. So thanks for doing this. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. You have uh, Haymarket has a really cool event coming up, right? Yeah. We, so we're, we're celebrating our 10th season uh, mm -hmm. this year, and it's an all handle season, so we're doing mm. three of my favorite pieces: uh, Aces and Galatea, um, uh, Apollo et Daphne, and then Orlando. Mm. Uh, and we're filming them in a in a, um, a film studio, so it'll be uh, no live audience because we're trying to protect our our patrons of um, and our artists as well. Uh, so the orchestra will be masked, and of course you'll have your mask on. Yep. <laughs> um, and uh, it's going to be a really fun beautiful season of music. I'm really excited about it. I can't wait to be a part of it. How can people check it out? So if you go to haymarketopera.org, uh, you can buy tickets and they're pretty inexpensive. Uh, the first show is October 30th, Aces and Galatea, and then uh, Apollo et Daphne is March 5th, and Orlando will be next June. Fantastic. This will be a really special thing, so please do uh, check that out. Yes. Cool. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. <laughs> <laughs>